It's very exciting. We didn't want you to miss out. Aww. And I thought you could use a drink. Hmm. Well, the glasses are over the sink. I have no reason to keep this around anymore, huh? Right. Huh? How's she doing? She's better. Now that she's got a fresh start. You know, Pride, thank you for letting me see this through. Closure's important. Believe me, I get that. So's trust. You worked alone for so long. Maybe... Maybe this team thing isn't for you. Well, look, I... I got what I needed. No, I'm good now, Pride. You can trust me. I hope so. May come a time when I have to make the call. And the team? They come first. You hear me? Loud and clear. Percy, it's time for you to try some of my homemade blackberry wine. Do I have to? Just, just put on the smiling face. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. No, he's good. I'm not kidding. <laughs> hey, to new beginnings. Dom Izzo. Really? Really, Dom? No. I like what Dom's doing. Okay. Dom Izzo. Jeez. Come on, Dom. What do you think I am, a magician? Yeah, I'm fired up, Dom. What else could I say? Yeah, absolutely. I was great to get on the field, and then Dom came up to me, and I'm trying to walk away from me. I just wanted to enjoy myself out there. Hot mic. Great job. <laughs> There's got to be some kind of intelligent question about something. Is a hot mic. Hot mic. On the networks of WDAY. You know, if it's not about sports, I find it very hard to concentrate. Here's Dom Izzo. Dom Izzo. Good Wednesday morning. This is Who in the Hell is Tom Izzy edition of Hot Mike on WDAY Extra, KSFL TV in Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls Live at Inforum.com on a hazy, smoky hump day, 14th day of June. 2023 it is officially over for our winter sports after the vegas golden knights won the stanley cup last night which we'll show you here in just a little bit if you thought that was a party town to begin with and it clearly is uh they took it to a new level with a uh, stanley cup championship last night and it's not the first professional team to win a championship there i know that's been thrown out the las vegas aces won the wnba championship last summer so pump the brakes on that but that was something else to uh to see that unfold and for minnesota sports fans it is the ultimate knife <laughs> in the back of uh professional success the minnesota wild or Minnesota North Stars, uh, there's been hockey in Minnesota basically for the last professional hockey for 60-some-odd years and have never won the Stanley Cup. They've only played in the Stanley Cup twice, I want to say, for the North Stars. The Vegas Golden Knights have been around six years and have played in two Stanley Cups and now have won one. I, heck, the Florida Panthers have played in two Stanley Cups since 1996 it is uh that is hard to swallow for minnesota sports fans this morning we'll show you that in a second first the the internet is a glorious place sometimes i'll just say that we you know we led our show yesterday with the update on uh former north dakota state standout grant nelson uh there is no official news yet on his next destination like we reported on monday after the news initially came out that um, it, he was going to go to Alabama, transfer to Alabama, my sources say nothing is decided yet. And as we sit here on Wednesday morning at 9.05, that is still the case. Um, but I got alerted to this yesterday on, on Twitter. This is a beauty because um, I've had – you know, that whatever rubes that disagree with me or other people, you know, will 
make fun of my name or whatever. It comes with the territory. This yesterday, though, is a first. Um, I don't I don't know what website this is attributed to. I don't know where it came from, but it's it's an all timer for uh, for me. Apparently, Tom Izzy of WDAY Sports in Fargo, North Dakota, says not a done deal on Grant Nelson to Alabama. Not sure where that came from. Tom Izzy. So, <laughs> so I, I told anybody here at the station if they're upset, just find this guy. If I, you know, if I've done something wrong, just blame him. So I'm sure for Stacey Anderson, who's our executive producer for all of our live sporting events, anytime I I don't throw it to break on time or if I mess up a, a, a sponsorship, blame this guy. Blame Tom Izzy, not me. <laughs> That's all-timer. Like, literally, I, I could build a house on how many times I've been asked if I'm related to Tom Izzo, the Michigan State Hall of Fame head coach. We are not, as far as I know. But Tom Izzy's pretty good. So if, if I end up being wrong on this story, which I know I'm not, but blame him. Blame that guy if uh, it ends up going off kilter. Tom Izzy. That is that was good. I am still chuckling at that one. I had a couple of uh, of good responses on this uh, as well once I posted it yesterday. Uh, I got to find one of them here, and then we can actually do start the show. Because <laughs> it was pretty good. Uh, I prefer Tommy Izzy, Vegas Better, Waste Management Officiatado. That's not bad. Keep up the great work, Tom. I got another one there. So, yeah, we'll uh, we'll do that. So, uh, I thought that was uh, a heck of a way to start our show. Lots to get to. We are packed to the gills uh, this morning. As we mentioned, we'll show you the Stanley Cup champions here in just a second. But the Minnesota Twins, because the, the hockey game was a boat race, the Twins gave us... Uh, reason to stand up and cheer. This is how this team is going to be this season. Just have to acknowledge it, that we're going to have stretches where they play god-awful like they did in Tampa and then turn it around and play as well as they did against um, t- uh, Toronto and then open up the series last night. Again, we can lament this. They're playing the Brewers in the middle of the week. They fell behind three rip in this game. Donovan Solano starts the rally with a base hit to right to make it 3-1. to one. It's 3-2 now when Kristen Yelich goes the opposite way for a two-run home run. Fennell is there. I'm sure he's going crazy. It's 5-2 Brewers at that point. But here come the Twins. Kyle Farmer hits this one to left. All right, so it's 5-3. That was off Corbin Burns, so they were doing something. Now we move to the bottom of the ninth. Michael A. Taylor leads it off and again continues to hit. That's his 10th home run already of the season. And it's a 5-4 game. This is off again. Donovan Williams, who's one of the best closers in the game. Here's Solano with a base hit to right. That's going to score Willie Castro, who is pinch running in that situation for Edward Julian, who walked. And the game is tied at five. That brings up Carlos Correa with an absolute laser beam off the facing of the second deck for a walk-off. Two-run home run, and the inning lasted literally like 10 minutes, and the game was over. And the Twins walk off the Brewers 7-5, to five, the first career walk-off home run for Carlos Correa in the process. And the Twins get a – this, by the way, was the best move. Correa getting out of the way of the Gatorade shower from Castro. That was kind of a slick move there. And the Twins win it. 7-5 the final. Good win last night. Good ball game as well. 34,000 in attendance, including our guy, Benel, who's got to be upset that his Brewers lost. But at least he got to see a walk-off. I hope he didn't leave. Um, how about that? Taylor with three home runs in five games. That's impressive in its own right. The Donovan Williams story is crazy. One run he allowed in 23 and a third innings and didn't get anybody out. In the ninth inning, his ERA actually jumped at 2.08 after uh, the blown save last night. That's a tough night for him. Solano with a nice night at the plate with a couple of RBIs, and the Twins are back over 500. 
<laughs> in that American League Central race because Cleveland and the White Sox lost. So the Twins gain a game on everybody. Two and a half up on the Guardians. Five and a half up, five and a half up on the White Sox and the Tigers. Detroit will be a target field beginning uh, tomorrow. But uh, nice win there in front of a great crowd. That's, again, I, I'll get to that in a second. I need more explanation of why in the world they're playing during the middle of the week. They'll wrap up the series with a matinee today. Bailey Ober will start for the Twins. Colin Ray will go for the Brewers. Mark of 3-3. Three and three. You see a uh, pretty solid ERA uh, for him so far this season. And Ober is, is pitched okay. Thought he was probably his worst start was last week against uh, Milwaukee. Now, real quick, why in God's creation are we playing these games in the middle of the week? Well, Dick Bramer will ask because he's coming up later on in the show. I doubt he has an answer on this, but it, it makes no sense to me when you're going to have packed houses like that. You, a, you know you have a ton of Brewer fans around the area or will come, and vice versa. The Twins are going to Milwaukee in the middle of the week next week. And why are they only two games? Same thing with the Brewers and uh, the Met, or the Mets and the Yankees are only playing twice. I just... I understand we're, we're playing everybody now, but these teams should be playing, A, on the weekend, and B, a three-game set. That atmosphere last night, if anybody watched the game or tuned in for just a little bit, you got – it was it was jumping. It was a it was a cool environment last night. So, And I'm sure it will be today for the wrap-up of the series at noon uh, from Target Field. As we mentioned, much more on the Twins coming up in our second hour. Uh, as we mentioned, we wrap up our, our first segment – as the hockey season officially ended last night, and I can't say with a thud, we were. Ho I was hoping for both the NBA and the NHL championship series to go the distance. You want, you want it to go as far as possible, and I can say we have not had that happen in either sport. In hockey, it's been 2019. I think was the Blues beat the uh, Bruins in seven games. Because since then, we have not had. Uh, a full seven-game set in the Stanley Cup. Uh, gosh, in basketball, it's been a bit. I'd have to say here, because last year was six with the Warriors winning, six with the Bucks beating the Suns, just off the top of my head here. The bubble, I think, was five or six when the Lakers won it. The Raptors won in six or five, six, I think, when they beat the Warriors. It's been... Anyway, it might be when LeBron and uh, the Cavs won. Was the last. Anyway, it's been a bit. So you're hoping it, it goes as far as possible. But I think for each of the championship series, what we saw was the best team clearly won, and the team they were playing ran out of gas. It happened in basketball with the Heat, and it happened last night with the Panthers in the Stanley Cup Final because Vegas, which was the best team in hockey, in the Western Conference throughout the season. We know the Bruins are the best regular season ever, but Vegas was the best in the West, and they showed it again last night. They came out in this game and flattened Florida. The Stanley Cup, of course, in the building after the Knights won in Game 4 on Saturday. Just so cool when you see the actual trophy. Mark Stone, the captain of the Golden Knights, had a heck of a night. They're a shorthanded goal. Look at all the time he had. Gets that by Sergei Bobrovsky to make it a one nothing Vegas lead. And, I mean, every time they capitalized, did the Knights here. Toe drag here. This one gets past Bobrovsky. Nicholas Haig is going to get credit for the goal. It's a 2 nothing Knights lead. Watch the replay. Bobrovsky thought he had it, but the puck got loose, and Haig is able to pounce on it to make it two rip. Aaron Ekblad will score here for Florida. The fact that he was even playing is remarkable. Paul Maurice said after the game that Ekblad was playing with like a broken shoulder and two other ailments. It's just ridiculous to me what hockey players will continue to play with uh, despite the fact that they are injured. But as soon as Florida got in the game, back come the Knights. Alec Martinez, who 
Won the Stanley Cup for the Kings a decade ago. That's a perfect shot. Makes it 3-1. to one. Literally, I I think I went outside to walk the dog, and I came back in. It was 2-1, to one and came back. It was 4-1 to one there as Riley Smith bangs home the rebound. And the party was, it was already going in Vegas. This made it even more crazy. And then the last three minutes of the second period, the game was over. Mark Stone on a one-timer for his second goal of the game. It's 5-1. to one. I mean, they were just toying with the Panthers here after that goal goes in. They add another at the end of the period to make it 6-1. to one. And then you got to give some love to the goaltending. Aiden Hill with the save of the playoffs. That comes in the third period. That is fantastic. I mean, the Vegas bench, of course, going crazy. Now, the only thing left was, would Stone get a hat trick? And Paul Maurice had pulled his goaltender, and there it is for the hat trick. First time that's happened in the Stanley Cup final since 1996. The hat's on the ice. The celebration about to begin as Las Vegas wins the Stanley Cup. It's still the it's the best sight when you see it, and we've had the I've had the pleasure of actually, I didn't touch it because I never played. That's the whole thing. If you don't win it, you can't touch it. I got my picture with it a couple of times. Actually, it was in Fargo here about uh, 14, 15 years ago, and the celebration last night as the Knights win it nine to three, most goals scored in a cup clinching game I think since the Penguins beat the North Stars way back in 1991. And the long-suffering Vegas fans can enjoy it. Jonathan Marshall Show was named the Conn Smythe winner, which goes to the playoff MVP. It's not just the uh, finals MVP. It goes to the, uh, the player who played the best throughout the entire postseason. Second fastest franchise to win a cup as an expansion team. The Edmonton Oilers were the only team to do it quicker. They won it in five years. The, be- the big story with Florida, Matthew Kachuk obviously didn't play. He p- had a broken sternum. He scored a goal to tie the game on Saturday with a broken sternum. Again, hockey players, just crazy. And the Knights are on top. And for the rest of us that follow the sport, love the sport, and see this happen, uh, they made this team... I think there are six original guys, Marshall Show being one of them, uh, from the expansion draft in 2017 when they came about. And we were visiting with Brad Schlossman about this last week, that they tweaked the rules after that, after Vegas came in, when Seattle came into the league, that they weren't able to do as much as what Vegas did. But, heck, look at Seattle was um, a win away from playing in the conference championship series. They lost in game seven to Dallas, or else it would have been Uh, Vegas and Seattle playing in the conference final, the two newest teams into the league. I will say this, and I heard this last night, and I I completely echo that sentiment that, you know, if if the Raiders end up winning, it'll it'll be big, but they came from another city, right? They're not Vegas's own. This is their, this is their team. And you can understand why the passion is so there. And, I vividly remember hearing that Las Vegas was going to get an expansion team. The NHL is going to go there. And what the, oh, wow, how this is going to work. And now football's obviously followed. You know the NBA is knocking down the door. And, heck, the athletics are, uh, are moving from Oakland to Vegas in baseball. It's just hysterical to me that even seven, eight years ago, the prospect of a, of a professional sports team in Vegas would have been laughable. And then a hockey team there would have been even more ludicrous. And then they're the champions of said league. All happened over the last six years. Pretty cool stuff. And for Minnesota fans, they wait and wonder when this is ever going to happen. We got a packed show coming up for you here this morning. In just a few minutes, Drew Trafton will join us uh, for minicamp overreaction time as uh, there are plenty of storylines abound, including around former Viking wide receiver uh, Stephon Diggs. He'll join us coming up at 920. Uh, at 935, you'll meet Adam Brill, who's the head ba- boys basketball coach uh, at Lincoln Pius X, where North Dakota State has found its latest uh, men's basketball recruit. 
in Trayson Anderson. Adam will give us the lowdown on the six foot ten monster that's coming to North Dakota State uh, next season. Of course, Dick Bramer will join us at ten o'clock, the voice of the Minnesota Twins. He'll give us uh, the lowdown after last night's exciting win and what to expect in the finale with the Brewers. And then at ten thirty five, we mentioned we're in the last week of uh, Minnesota high school sports. The Faustin Greyhounds are still playing baseball. They won yesterday. They'll play in the Class A semifinals later tonight in St. Cloud. Ryan Hanlon will join us from St. Cloud as the Greyhounds look to get to the state championship game and a date at CHS Field in St. Paul on Friday. Uh, he'll join us coming up at 1035, I believe, from the batting cages, even the best place uh, to join the show. So a lot to get to here on a busy Wednesday. We'll take a break. Hot mic off and rolling. We're back after this. On WDAY Extra, KSFL TV, and in forum.com.
the biggest Seahawks, Sounders, and Mariners fan in the FM area, it's time for Views with Drew. Hey, buddy boy. Hey. I, uh, I got two things for you. Okay. First, uh, the writer's strike now is really starting to get me. I don't know I if you saw, saw the, yeah. the massive shuffle of everything now. Huh? So yesterday, I, I just started noticing it on, on my timeline. Yeah. Just, it's funny you yeah. mentioned that because I, I noticed that just that kind of anecdotally good. yesterday. All of a sudden, all these projects are getting moved back to 2027. Nope. And the next, I saw the next Avatar movies pushed back to like. I haven't even watched the last 2029. one. 2029. I just watched it. Is it any good? Um, yeah, it's it's good. Avatar's weird for yeah. me because it's like there's only been one of them before this, right. and it's and that was been so long. Nine. Yeah, and so it's not like you can be super invested in that as like a property or a franchise. Yeah. It's visually stunning. Right. I mean, it, which, which awesome. you know, right. you know, like going into James it. James Cameron, it's going to be cool. Yeah. yeah. In, in the same way that any sort of like wildlife documentary is going to, yep. you know, kind of suck you in. Um, this is the same way. And it's all the more impressive because you're just making it up, you know, this world right. up, uh, this ecosystem up. But I mean, it's, you know, like it's got one of those stories. Like, I mean, it's, it's like just kind of a boilerplate, you know, like it's yeah. very, it's very much like, you know tropes that we've seen in films before but it's okay okay so for people that missed it this is from variety yesterday for those that follow this like drew and i like these kind of movies deadpool 3 which is the first that's going to be on the mcu has yeah. been moved up now from um, november 8th of 2024 to may 3rd of 2024 an untitled star wars movie is debuting on december 18th 2026 we have no idea what that is yeah right they don't Do we have a hint on either. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Does they Star just, Wars know what they're doing? They kind of put out like Does all Disney of these projects. That, right? They're like, we're going to do all of this so then uh, eventually. The Marvel thing is this. is the, So Captain yeah. America, the one now with Anthony Mackie, yeah. is moving from May of 2024 to July of 2024. The Thunderbolts movie, which I am keen about, yeah. goes from December uh, to December 20th, 2024. And they've already filmed that one, right? And I think so. Question mark? I think, or they <laughs> and they I know I think they filmed this the Captain America one. Right. Too. That one I know they That's have. In the can. Yes. Yeah. Blade, which is the uh Maharsha Ali uh movie from to February fourteenth, twenty twenty five. Which is a reboot of that entire right. franchise, which is cool. Fantastic four to May second, twenty twenty five. And then the two new Avengers movies are going to yeah. 26 and 27. And the second uh, Batman movie, which is in the DCU yeah. with the Matt Reeves Batman series with Robert Pattinson, has now too? been pushed back to, like, I think, when? another year. Jeez. I think back into 2027. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to make it to any of these. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so now there's two Star Wars movies, though. A separate Star Wars movie has been pushed from December 19th, 2025 to May 22nd, 2026. So there's two Star Wars movies yeah. then in 26. Last time that happened, that didn't that go did over so well. That did not go well. Because that was Solo and uh, The Last Jedi. Yeah. Yeah. That, was, that didn't go over so well. I thought they had well. sworn off doing yes. that. I thought they had said, we're not going <laughs> to fill oh, the calendar. You'll answer your own question. Yeah. They, they don't even know what they're doing here. Yeah. Because I mean, they maybe, don't know when anybody's going back to work. Maybe they're just holding those spots right now, and then they're going to shuffle them up again. <laughs> um, but well, that begs the question, like, what are we going to have? Yes. You know I mean? Right. We, we do live in this world of constant streaming, and there's always... Right. There's always content to explore that you haven't discovered yet. I didn't know there was a new but, Alien movie. Did you know that? No. Produced by Ridley Scott. It's opening on August 16th, huh. 2024. I haven't seen Covenant yet. Yeah. I haven't either. Have I, you I'm seen, not big have on you, the Have Alien you not franchise. seen any of those? Yeah. Okay. I, I, mean, I, I've I like seen, them. I've seen like the first one. I sh um, swore off four. Yeah. Three is, but the first two are classic. First two are, you're, there's no uh, impugning any of those. Yeah. yeah, you're right, though. I, I wonder... Like, what are we going to have? Because with COVID shut everything down, that we we didn't have any Marvel stuff for, a, like, a, a year, while. and then we had yeah. a boatload, yeah. which probably had too much. I know Secret Invasion starts next week yes, on streaming that's with Samuel be, Jackson. That looks really great. Cool. Have you seen the trailer? I have. That? That's pretty good. That looks good. I Better I, enjoy it, because we don't yeah. know... We're not getting anything else until, like, 2027. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that... And the cast on that show... Pretty Olivia good. Coleman, yeah. Yeah. an Oscar winner. Yep. Amelia Clark, yep. you know, which is Mother great that Dragons she's back into yep. a, you know, a franchise. Yep. Um, I mean, she's been in several Terminator. Yep. Uh, she did Game Star Wars. Thrones, she did Star she Wars. She was in Solo, yeah. But you know, like it seems like let's let's get her back in there, and, and then Samuel L. Jackson and uh, Don Cheadle's in it. Yeah, Don, Brody's that's in it. Right. So yeah. that'll be. Yeah. I'm interested to see that because they swore off any Avengers are mm -hmm. in it, quote right, unquote. Right. Or the yeah. big ones that are in it. Yeah. So I, 
with well, with Marvel, it's important because they they have a specific schedule. They don't want stuff coming yeah. out beforehand, right? And, and it and screws I mean, up the timeline of things. And we kind of saw a little bit about what that was like. I haven't seen Guardians three yet. I, I, I've heard though that was originally supposed to be the the kickoff to Phase Four, yeah, right? Which was supposed to come after the Infinity War <laughs> saga. But then there was some stuff with with their director James right. Gunn, and they they got rid of Fired him for a bit. Him, yeah. They brought him back, yep. and then. That got pushed all the way back into phase five right. of, of of the MCU. You know, we're thirty some odd films <laughs> in, and you wouldn't think the order would matter so much anymore. But it kind of oh, does. does. Yeah, it you know, does. And, and I heard that that you can't just show up and if that watch movie it. had started phase four, things might look different now, and it might it might feel a little bit different. And because that movie's been getting rave reviews, it's good. And it's I, good. I highly, okay. I highly good. encourage you to, to go hear see that. it. It's, it's, it's the best Marvel one they've had in a little bit. I'll say that. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, we sit here on the 14th of June, and there's NFL news abound. You want to start either with Stephon Diggs or Justin Jefferson? What diva wide receiver well, you want to talk I mean, about I've first? I've heard both guys. Because one's working and one's not right now. Best shape of their lives, yes. right? Let's start with Stephon. Let's so the guy who's not there. He's not there. there yeah. And the, the piece of video that started circling yesterday I had forgotten about at the end of the Bills Bengals playoff game when oh, right. the, it was yeah. over. I think we have this there. He's yeah. over on the bench, and this was at, at the upset. end of the game, and he's freaking out on Josh Allen. And Josh Allen said yesterday, this is not football related. So if it's not mm. contract related and it's not football related, this is the part like there's digs, and we've seen this before. Viking fans have went down, they've seen this road yeah. before when with he and cousins. Before he got dealt um, that in sure 2020, looks football related, right? I mean, to that, there that, it does, yeah. but there, there's some disconnect going on because he just signed a contract yeah. last year, right? And Allen's saying it's not. And he was very happy related, about it's team related. Okay, so I don't know what's I don't know what's going up here, yeah. but this is not That's not, great. not good for Buffalo. Uh, no, he and, makes I mean, they, them go. Yes, yeah, I mean, in that. The thing, the thing, to me. That, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. And, and I mean, that was a key piece that they were missing. Yep. You know, when it came to, okay, well, what's, what's this chasm between them and Kansas City? Um, and it, but it feels to me like Buffalo had their shot. I almost feel that like that was Cincinnati, my next question. Do you think the window's already yeah, closed? Yeah, I Buffalo? do. Wow. I think, I think that the way, I mean, the NFL, you only get three, I, I feel like you get three seasons at most yeah. to keep a Super Bowl window open unless, unless you're the you New England Patrick Patriots, <laughs> unless you're, yeah, yeah. Kansas City, yeah. but only one or two teams are going to have that guy at a time. Josh Allen's really, really good. I'm not I'm not discounting Josh Allen, but you only get a limited time, and then if any cancer leaks in, yeah. you're toast. Allen, you know, like Allen gotta said we got to re- get it. Relaunch it. He said a little bit better than what we're doing here, incorporating him a little bit better than what we're doing here and getting him the ball or getting him more involved in the game plan. I mean, Allen said that it's related to teamwork and has to do more with just football, but he placed some responsibility on himself saying there's things I could do better to help out with this process and trying to get him back here and be the Buffalo Bills that he's meant be, uh, be the Buffalo all Bill that, that he's meant to be. All That's, that sounds like to me is they're appeasing digs. Yeah. You know, they're just trying to get him in the building. The Vikings tried for a while yeah. and then said, nah, we're not going to do that anymore. You know, fortunately for the Vikings. And it worked so, out because they got Justin Jefferson in the process. So. Who I think is, uh, you know, of, of all one. the receivers yep. in the NFL, That's if you're going to appease one guy, That's the he's one. it. Right. Like you build around him. Which he is, is why, so good. Well, at least my next topic, because Jefferson showed up for mandatory minicamp yesterday. Daniil Hunter didn't. Right. And I'm, I'm like, all right, well, again, to your point, you pay, you have to pay him. You have to yes. pay Jefferson whatever, whatever he, wants. he wants. So that means cutting Daniil or trading him so that the money is there to pay this guy. Yeah. You go and do and that. I didn't realize that Daniil Hunter's contract, I thought it would be bigger. You know, well, like, this is the third year because they've reworked right. it the they've last two reworked years. It so yeah. much that I figured that a bunch of money had get gotten pushed yeah. back and that me, that the number was going to be bigger, but it's it's not that huge of a contract to eat. I would imagine that there's going to there're going to be teams lined up to to For get guy, him in see, in-house. If he was healthy last him. year. Remember the two prior yeah. years he wasn't. He barely yes. played in 20 and 21. Last year he had 10. I mean, yeah. He was 28 a t- years double old. Double digit sack guy yeah. entering the prime of his career. I mean, he, and if, like get and, in line. And if I'm the Vikings, I'm all right to to move on. I'm yeah, all right to I say, so. you know what? This if we have to tear it down to the studs, which they may after after this season if they decide mm-hmm. that they're not going to pay cousins, then I'm not, all right with that. Yeah, and they're, they're yep. not 
void of talent on that roster, no. even if they do, you know, have to have to move on into they're in a good spot, I, I think. Like get that draft capital. Why yeah. not? Like go yeah. for it. And you're gonna like you said, if they're gonna move on from cousins, you're gonna need it. Right. Because these guys, these these quarterbacks that are coming out, like the top three guys yeah. in that class at right. least, yep. they're gonna come at a premium and they're gonna be teams there but, that are gonna be looking to move down off of those spots. But then are you are you upsetting him? By hey, we got a rookie wide receiver coming in because he got the ball as much as anybody last yeah. year with Cousins getting it to him. Do you reset this whole thing and then you put yourself in in the same you know boat that the Bills the are in right yeah, now? With, with you know, Diggs, sure. Um, I don't know. That's the, the that's the dilemma that they're in right yeah, now. That, that's and they why they Quas- have made Quasi gets the big right, bucks, and they have know? but they have made every indication that they are not going to pay for older talent. They mm-hmm. moved on from Thielen. They moved on from. I mean, Dalvin Cook's not old, but they moved on from yeah. from Dalvin yeah. Cook at 28 years old. They're going to likely move on from Daniil Hunter. Talk here. about with all of the production that Eric they've Hendricks, had. Eric Hendricks, they moved on. It seems like know? they're adopting that New England Patriots yeah. model of of sell high. Yeah, you know, sell when these guys are high, get some value, and just I make think sure they that you're not Dalvin, losing though, everything. Though, because I think they could have made a deal and got Probably, something for yeah. him. Yeah, it sounded well, I mean, like it. It is kind of bonkers to think that we live in an NFL culture, <laughs> you know, like climate now, where a guy who's 28. Who's who's you know like arguably at the top of his game? Yes, with some injury concern, but with the production that he's had, like he's walking, right? You know, like yeah. that. That is that was kind of a I don't know. I was I was surprised by that. I thought they'd find some some team right. willing to play ball. This is from the Star Tribune. I know we got a roll here. This says the surest signal that the Vikings are angling towards a rebuild, like we said, and trying to get their salary cap in better shape in twenty four and really twenty five, as if they move on from Daniel Hunter, which yeah. is accurate. That's yeah. I mean. That's clearly where they want to go with it. And it's, it's not if a bad time do to rebuild. I mean, the, the NFC is weak. You know, it's 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 at a oh, weak yeah. point. You know, I mean, it is. That's, to go back to your point, then, is the 49er window closed after this year? I mean, it's been open now for a couple. They've, I mean, they, they've done a really good job of, of building out to the point where they can be sustainably successful, but they just haven't hit on the quarterback. Right. And that has been. And they've had other injury concerns. Yep. Debo Samuel right. goes down. I'm not super convinced Christian McCaffrey can stay healthy for yep. an entire season. George Kittle, same thing. Yep. You know, like they 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 have some concerns there. Their defense is really good though too, and that that's really carried them. I, the 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 Diggs thing is really fascinating to me. I'm yeah. really interested. But where on does that. he go? You know, is he reaching that Terrell Owens territory <sighs> where he becomes just and that that's a loaded question yeah. to to throw out there at the very end of this, but. You know, I mean, how many more cracks does he get? Oh, with the talent he has, uh, he'll get another. Because he's not Antonio Brown. No. Like, that that's for sure. But is he to that point where— But if where you can't make it work with Josh Allen, I, I just I don't know. look at know. Minnesota. Yeah. He's just ranked the best place yeah. you can go in the NFL. Best place to work. And yeah. he couldn't make it work yeah. there. And then you go to a culture in Buffalo where they're building to yep. something with a superstar quarterback. You can't make it work there? Yeah. Like, who's which team Which team will make it work? All right. You know, which coach do you have to go to to make it work? It, 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 that really limits your options if you're Stephon Diggs. Last question. Seeing Vegas win last night as a fan of teams that have never, you know, <laughs> yeah. you saw the Seahawks win. It took a while yeah. for Seattle to get there. Boy, did it. Um, yeah. The Mariners have never, had, won. have never won it. You know, it, how do you, when you see a team, like, yeah. I saw, like you know, it's cool. I, I The last two nights, Denver and Vegas franchises that never won before. I always like that. That's yeah. cool. I oh, like the newness of it rather the Nuggets than seeing win is the so Warriors cool. win again or yeah. another. You know, like seeing the Avalanche win or you know what I mean. Something different. Yeah, but that's cool. But I see six years. Six years, and they did this. Yeah. I mean, Seattle was the a two breath Stanley away. Cup finals right. in six years. The Kraken were a breath away from playing in the conference yeah. final in their second year. Yeah, as a as a fan of teams that have been around for. 60 some odd years and have won it right twice I'm like it's really it's tough it's cool to see a team have instant success but also you're like I, I the cynic in me is like we'll see what their fans do if they go through a 10-year stretch where they don't see you know call me when you don't have success I want to see yeah. like how great your fans are then uh, but I don't think that's gonna happen good for them I no think I, they, I, think, I think they are I think they might because, be legit and too. I mentioned this before you came on and we'll, we'll wrap with this it's is their that, team right? right they were the first yeah. there it's not like the Raiders the Raiders came yeah. from a different city they are their own yeah. I, I don't think that fan base is going anywhere I, I I agree with that a part of it too with the with the cynic side of it is I don't like seeing hockey franchises and warm climates yeah. have success <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just like you have well, you have enough nice so things. So listen to this. Okay? Since 1993, the last time a Canadian team won the Stanley Cup, right? Yeah. Teams in Dallas, Raleigh, Tampa, Anaheim, L.A., and now Vegas have yeah. won the Stanley Sometimes Cup. Sometimes several times over. Right. right? Since 93, when yeah. the last time a Canadian team won the Cup, we've had now Man. six wet, warm weather cities. Yeah. When sometimes, like you mentioned, multiple, and it does Stanley make it Cups. all the more special when s- those teams in those cl- those and that's not counting climates. Like San Jose's played for yeah. the cup. Nashville's right. played for the cup. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. Man. It's, I mean, good, good for Vegas. You know, yep. I'll, I'll just be happy for them. But you know, and eh, it's eh, yeah, you know, move it's, along, <laughs> have your parade, have a good time with it. Oh, they'll have a good time. Oh, There's yeah. no doubt about that. Great to see you, man. I know you're busy this week. Thanks for coming by. Hey, thanks for having me. Drew Trapton joining us each and every Wednesday here on the show. We'll take a break. We come back. North Dakota State's newest men's basketball commit stands all of six foot ten. His head coach will join us from Lincoln, Nebraska, when we come back on Hot Mike on a Hump Day with Tom Izzy right after this.
Welcome back, everybody, to Hot Mike here on a Hump Day Wednesday edition. WDOY Extra, KSFL TV in Sioux Falls, in forum.com. We mentioned yesterday, uh, late Monday night, North Dakota State uh, nabbed its first verbal commitment for men's basketball for the class of 2024. The Bison went to a a uh, familiar state into Nebraska where David Richmond's found some dudes, Jared Samuelson from Gretna, Sam Greasel from Lincoln, Sam Hostreiter from, also from Lincoln, and uh, they went right back into Lincoln, same high school as well, uh, to get six foot ten, uh, Trayson Anderson, who will be a senior this upcoming year in high school before he'll be a member of the Bison for the class of 2024. His head coach is Adam Brill from Lincoln Pius X in Lincoln, Nebraska. He's good enough uh, to join us on this Wednesday morning, six foot ten. Is that uh, are we are we scraping door frames? Are we actual on six ten? I know sometimes in basketball they fudge some stuff. Is that accurate? Uh, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and uh, to be really honest, I I still think there's a little bit more room oh for boy. growth. <laughs> Holy cow! Um, you know that he, he tracing is a little young and uh to be honest he's really he's, he's he's his body is still developing you know he's he he he's not growing a whole lot of facial hair just yet so that's a that's a pretty good sign there for coach richmond huh uh adam tell us about tracing the player and what kind of development arc is he is he on i know he he we were just visiting off air he wasn't used a whole lot as a sophomore and then really mushroomed last year as a junior what kind of trajectory is he on right now I mean, his sophomore year, he had three guys that were in front of him um, that, you know, Sam Hostrider, you guys are all familiar with Sam. Um, and then Sam's twin brother, Jack, who's at South Dakota State. Um, and then also a kid named Brady Christensen, who is uh, playing a lot of minutes down at Washburn University, um, all in front of him. And so we were able to really develop him and he was really able to push those guys in practice and they were really able to push him in practice. And so it was just, it was hard to get him uh, a substantial amount of minutes his sophomore year. Um, but it was really, really good for his development. Um, his junior year, you know, obviously those guys graduated. And so he ate all those minutes up. Mm. You know, I think he was, I think he was playing close to 30 minutes a game out of 32 minutes for us, you know, 29, 30, 30 minutes or so. Um, you know, as far as his development, um, you know, the strides that he made from sophomore year to junior year were, were pretty drastic um, in terms of his production. Obviously, his minutes went up, but he was the only guy in Class A basketball that was averaging a double-double. Mm. Uh, you look at Class A last year, and there were a lot of guys that were about 6'8", 6'9", you know, especially in Lincoln. And so – for him to be the only guy in class A to average a double doubles is pretty phenomenal. So he's really active on the glass on both ends of the floor. Um, obviously he shot, had a high percentage around the rim. Um, you know, as far as his development goes, um, you know, his best days are, 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 are ahead of him mm. and the ceiling is really, really high for him. I look at that area and obviously North Dakota state, South Dakota state have feasted at your school Describe that of of knowing you've got Summit League mid-major type players there and that uh, colleges are, are keeping an eye on what you're doing down there. Um, I think for us, it's a, um, we're the smallest Class A school in terms of our enrollment. Um, we have a really good youth program, and we pour a lot of time into our kids uh, and their development. And we try to look at the trajectory in which they're on. It'd be real easy for us to play, you know, Sam, Jack, and Brady, and even Trayson, and just sit them down in the post, mm. you know, and go four round one. We're gonna bang you in, and and but are we really developing our guys? You know, that's not fair to them because they all have aspirations um, to play at the next level, mm. and we have to develop their all around skills you know, their ability to pass, their ability to shoot, their ability to handle the rock, their ability to make decisions. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's a testament to our kids putting in the time that they do, um, getting in the gym and working on their skills, not only with us, but then each other and then challenging themselves with other trainers and those kinds of things. So, I mean, um, 
that's a really, really big compliment that, that you gave us just there to our kids and, and to our program. Knowing now, I know it, the spotlight was probably on him a little bit last year. It's going to be full blown for this upcoming year. Have you had that discussion with him? Or is that something as you get close or, or do you even need to? He knows full well that double teams, maybe triple teams are coming his way this upcoming basketball season. Um, I think he's pretty aware of it. Um, you know, one of his best attributes and one of his best skills right now um, is his ability to pass. You know, he can throw the one-handed overhead side hook. He can throw the, the pocket pass. He can skip it across the floor um, to the 45 or the opposite corner. You know, he can, he can throw the one-handed drift pass. Like, he, he's a, a very, very underrated passer. Mm. And so, he, honestly, like last year, we really welcomed teams doubling him. And he did too, <laughs> you know, because we had some pretty good shooters. And so he could spray it out to those guys. And, and that would actually help him to operate more one-on-one -on -one when he got the ball uh, in his spots. And so, um, as far as him welcoming um, that attention, I think he's a little used – he's used to the double teams and he's used to being, you know, getting a lot of hands on him on the glass and those kinds of things. I think, I think um, for him, it's almost going to be more of a relief. Um, obviously with this commitment, it's a little less pressure for him and let's think he can just kind of play a little bit more freely. And um, as far as welcoming the double teams and the triple teams and stuff like that, I think he's, he's used to that. What was there a game or a pra moment in practice for you? Is it okay? We got something here. Like he's 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 starting to figure it out. Was there a, a wow moment? Um, I think the wow moment for me, if I'm being really honest with you, was Trey might have been in like seventh grade. Yeah, and we were at a camp, and and uh, we knew we knew where he went to school. We obviously, went to a Catholic school, and we knew he was coming to Pius and all that, but. He, he, we were doing a full court transition drill and, and he was obviously bigger than everybody at that age too. And his footwork and his ability to change direction and how smooth it was with his handle um, was like, Oh, okay. Uh, you know, as, as like a seventh grader, you know? And so we, we kind of knew he was going to be a pretty special player. We just had to keep, um, keep him motivated and uh, keep him working on his game and, uh, to help him reach the things that he wanted to reach. You know, the other thing that we, we kind of was eye opening was we always like to sit down with our guys um, in, in the summer or um, right at the beginning of the fall when we get them. And, you know, we sat down with Trey when he was a so uh, freshman at the end of his freshman season. And we just, what, what do you want to get out of basketball Trey? And he, and he well, I want to play division one basketball. Mm. Oh, okay. Now that allows us, we know how, how to push you, how to coach you. Um, how to hold you accountable. So, I mean, just his, his, his vision for, for wanting to be a division one player at that young of an age um, was, 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 was eye opening as well. I would say last year, you know, the big thing for us um, with him um, that we got to keep stressing with him is, is, is motor, you know, when you're a four or five and you're going to play at the division one level, mm. you know, it's, it's not all, always about, I mean, obviously you, you want skill, you know, you want the ability to pass, shoot it, finish, um, have multiple moves around the hoop and be able to have soft hands and catch in tight spaces and make decisions and all that. But your motor has to be almost better than everybody else on the floor. And so we keep stressing that we keep clipping things and showing him examples. And, and, and I think the light switch is really, really close to hitting there to where it's nonstop. But there was a moment in practice where he, he got an offensive rebound. He made an outlet. We got the ball on a pitch ahead and he's flying down the floor and a guy missed it, missed the layup, and, and Trey was right there and, and, and almost, you know, put it back with a, with a tip dunk. You know, mm. he got fouled on the play, and I'm running from the other end, and everybody's celebrating it. Like, like I think that was another moment of, huh. okay, this is the next step for you, big fella. So, My last question before I let you go, Adam, how big I think the Grant Nelson effect is, seeing a guy from North Dakota State uh, go to the NBA draft. I know he, he left and is, is likely transferring, but – to see that a player can develop at North Dakota State to reach potentially the NBA. Is that an effect for at a school like yourself to see that from that far away? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that was a big part um, 
in in trace and wanting to commit right now mm. instead of waiting until july you know he, he he's he's going to go out on the aau circuit and you know there could be some other schools that right. try to pursue him um, but i think with his journey and his his individual journey that he's on and his path it might be different than other people like i'm telling you guys his his best basketball is ahead of him and he's not even close uh to reach in that ceiling yet and to be at a school like a North Dakota state that has that track record of really putting in the time and developing guys, you know, as they progress on mm. their individual journeys. I mean, you look at even Sam Griesel, like Trayson works out with Sam Griesel. Mm. He works out with Sam Hostrider, you know, the ability to have the time to develop and to be worked with and, and to, work on your body to work on your fitness and all of those things. I, I think that was a really, really, really big part in, in him being attracted um, to North Dakota state. And so, I think so the David Nelson effect, I would say, yeah, absolutely. But I think also some of the more local kids that he knows like yeah. Sam and Sam. So thanks so much for giving us the Intel, bud. I appreciate it. Have a great summer and we'll catch up again. Uh, once basketball gets going. All right. Really appreciate the time. Thank you for asking me to be a part of this. No problem. Yeah. All right, have a great one, bud. Adam Brill, head coach at Lincoln Pius X in Lincoln, Nebraska, where North Dakota State has found its newest basketball commit in Trace and Anderson, all of six foot ten, and as Adam said, may not be done growing yet. We'll take a break, wrap up the show again, wrap up our one. Dick Braver coming up for our two in just a few minutes. Hot Mike continues on a hump day Wednesday. We're back right after this.
Our thanks to Adam Brill for giving us a few minutes. We'll come back. Dick Bramer will join us as the Twins hit the diamond here in a couple hours to wrap up their series with the Brewers. Hour two of Hot Mike begins right after this. This is Hot Mike. Hot Mike. On the networks of WDAY. WDAY. Here's Dom Izzo. A drive to left field. He has done it again. And a leaping catch on the warning track. Got it. And the Twins complete the sweep. Right back at the ball yard after last night's thriller as the Twins walked off the Brewers. Dick Bramer joins us from 
Target Field as the Twins and Brewers will wrap up uh, this series at noon. Uh, no confirmation you actually slept at the ballpark, right? You actually got to go no, home. I, I, uh, <laughs> I have my sleeping bag uh, rolled up over here in the corner. This is the workroom <laughs> behind our broadcast booth. No, I actually made it home, got a short night's sleep, but um, I think uh, everybody slept more soundly with what happened in the ninth inning than they would have otherwise. I think for people who were watching last night, you can illustrate this. I know you did, you and Justin Morneau on the broadcast, that Devin Williams had been locked down heading into that game last night. I think that's – if you're taking anything from it, and granted it could all go sideways today if the Brewers win, but if you take anything from last night was how effective they were against one of the very best in baseball. He had an ERA of, what, 0 0.47 going into the Man. game and given up just a solo home run in a 21 innings of work, something like that, and he didn't get anybody out. <laughs> and the home runs, of course, are great, right? But in the middle of that inning – Edward Julian drew a huge walk, you know, and, and he showed great patience and and a great sense of what a strike was and wasn't against a guy who has just been outstanding this year for Milwaukee. So he faced four men, all four men scored, and the Twins had arguably, well, certainly one of the biggest wins they've had in the history of Target Field. You mentioned it on the on the home run call of Carlos Correa's moment. That's his, first, his signature moment with the Twins. I thought the same thing when the ball uh, left the yard. I had no idea, though. That was his first career walk-off home run. Of a guy of that stature, you would think he would have a couple of those by now. That was his first last night. In the regular season, yeah. he's, he had a couple of them in the postseason. And, uh, you know, we've been saying it now for weeks. This team has just kind of been stuck in neutral right? Ever since that four game winning streak to start the season. And then the lineup has been the biggest culprit. Well, the lineup will get going. Mm. Once the big shooters start getting some big hits, yeah. there's no bigger shooter in a twins uniform than Carlos Correa. He got the big grand slam in uh, Toronto a couple of days ago and an even bigger home run last night. So maybe we will see, and I've been pointing to this homestand really for, for weeks now, Maybe this will be the pivot point for this Twins team that have really been bobbing on the surface of 500, and that's about it since that four-game winning streak. Ten games at home, big game here today, obviously. The Tigers are coming in. they got to play a doubleheader today, and then four games here at Target Field, and four with the Red Sox, yeah. and maybe we'll look back at this homestand as being the one that finally turned the season around. I want to go back to uh, last Thursday and after the game with, <laughs> I think you call it the flop at the trop, which I thought was brilliant, by the way. Um, the the mood going, especially going into Toronto and knowing the Blue Jays are playing well, and then to have the couple of games and heck, even Sunday prior to uh, the bottom of the seventh and eighth innings of what happened there, that that was a complete 180. Was Did that surprise you on how well they played in Toronto? It shouldn't have, but I think it did yeah. because they just, you know, hey, the Rays are good, right? They're the best team yep. in baseball. So you lose three to them. That's not ideal. But, you know, they just showed why they are so good. Key hits, pitching, fielding, base running, all of it. They really put on a show against the Twins. But we've seen it from this Twins team before. The ability to play toe-to-toe, uh, -to -toe, if you will, against some of the best teams in baseball. They, you know, they won the season series against Houston, four games to two. They won the season series against the Yankees. So we have seen snapshots along the way this season that this team can be really good. And if they can get to October, I can see them doing some damage. Mm. But, you know, then you, you have a disappointing game like the final game in Toronto and you go, well, now how are they going to recover from that? And they turned the game inside out in the ninth inning last night. And so it's been the lack of consistency that's been frustrating for the team. And I know for the fans. So maybe we'll see what we think this team really can be starting with the win last night throughout the homestand and beyond. Well, you know, we'll have to wait and see. We've got 90 some games left. And I'd like to believe that this the best baseball is ahead yet for this team. June Suhan was tweeting out here about 10 minutes before you and I talked that Byron Buxton was on the field to do some running this morning. Any update on closer or how soon we may see him back? Obviously, today has to be something about how, how much pain he's still feeling in his ribs. Right. He's not in the starting lineup today. I just got the starting lineup, and if you want, I can give it to you yep. here before we leave our yeah. segment. Uh, but um, uh, I expect he... I hope he'll be ready to go tomorrow for the start of the Tiger series. 
but I don't know that. It depends on pain tolerance, yeah. and then you know what. If you add them to the roster, you got to take somebody off, and and you know it's a nice problem to have. But we'll see if they activate him. I'm I'm pretty confident it'll be sometime during the Detroit series, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. And I do have the lineup, but it, they released it just before we hit the air here. It's Edouard Julien uh, leading things off, playing second base. Uh, Donovan Solano at third. Alex Kirilov playing first base, hitting third. Carlos Correa, shortstop, hitting cleanup. Trevor Larnick, the designated hitter. Joey Gallo hitting sixth, playing left field. Max Kepler in right, hitting seventh. And then Christian Vasquez catching, hitting eighth. And Michael A. Taylor uh, hitting ninth and playing center field. I have to ask you about Michael A. Taylor because we talked about his addition heck, when we started this segment in March, knowing full well it was for depth for Buxton and for his glove. He's hit better than I thought for power as well, at least for me. Has that even surprised the Twins on how well he has hit the ball in in the first two and a half months of the season? Well, when he hit his ninth in Toronto, um, he matched his season total from a year ago. Yeah. So the next day I went up to him, and he's just the nicest guy in the world. So in addition to being a pretty good ball player, he's one of those guys that you just enjoy spending time with. So I said, what's the difference? And, you know, you don't, you don't hit nine home runs <laughs> one year and on pace to hit 23, 24 right. the next without something changing. And he said, when the twins acquired him, they wanted him to get back and using a leg kick that he used in his heyday with mm -hmm. the Washington nationals, he dropped the leg kick then because he wanted to be more contact conscious. And when he came to the twins and this shouldn't surprise anybody at this point, they said, Hey, look, we want you to hit for power. We want you to drive the ball. He was reluctant to pick up the leg kick again. But then right around May 1st, he decided, okay, let's give it a try. The Twins have been encouraging him to bring it back, to, to you know, step back and try to, you know, drive the ball more. And so the results have been there. And so when we showed video of his April yeah. stance, and it was just a little Paul Molitor slide step, if you will, and now almost a Kirby Puckett leg kick, <laughs> and the results have been there. I mean, when you know he hit the, the first home run in the ninth inning last night, that was a fastball up, and he almost hit it into the ivy in the batter's yeah. eye. That was a long, long, long poke. So it's an example of players, and pitchers do it too. We've seen Griffin Jacks go through it on the pitching side. If something doesn't feel right, you want to get better. As tough as it might seem for the rest of us, they are able to make adjustments within a season, and that's exactly what we've seen from yeah, Michael A. Taylor. I mean, that's, he's been a, a total blessing. I mean, clearly, obviously, what he's done defensively, but his pr production, at least to me, has been eye-opening. That I was not counting on when they signed him. Like, that has been a really pleasant surprise for them this year. Yeah, and then, you know, we've, of course – miss Buxton in the lineup, but we really, in all honesty, yeah. we don't miss them that much defensively because the guy we've got out there is pretty doggone good. Jorge Polanco, I know, got pulled up lame in the game on Thursday against uh, against Tampa, again with the hammy. This, this may, I don't know, plague him the whole year, Dick, but this is nothing. Now they can't rush him back. Clearly, if he, if he was rushed back or he felt like he wanted to come back and, and aggravate it again because this can – really get bad with a hamstring injury like this. Right, and same too for Caleb Thielbar, yeah. who said his oblique pole was in a different spot, not the same spot, but on the same side, and he only got into one game. So I, and I'm obviously not a doctor, I'm not a trainer, I just know it might be the prudent thing to not expect these guys to come back now before the All-Star break, and they're both key guys to this team. Yeah. But it does create an opportunity for Julianne, and we talked about the big walk last night, the power he's shown to the opposite field. He'll get a chance up here now yeah. to be an impact player. I mean, he's not just, you know, he's not hitting eighth or ninth. He's hitting leadoff for a team that maybe the lineup is starting to click a little bit now with a couple of rookies in the lineup in the infield in Julian and Royce Lewis. So we'll have to wait and see. I think the presence of Julian and the intriguing talent that he can bring yeah. to a lineup will allow the twins to maybe play it safe with Polanco and make sure that when he does come back, whenever that is, he'll be ready to go. Well, it's tantalizing because Julian does what he did last night. You know, he draws the walk and, and doesn't hack away at some pitches out of the strike zone and able to get on base that you're able to tolerate maybe some things in the field because he's doing that at the plate, right? 
Right. And, and what I really look for when young players come up, and we've seen it from Lewis, and we've seen it now from Julian, aptitude. Now, yeah. he'd never faced Devin Williams before, right? And Williams was on a roll, just about unhittable so far this year. And all he did, you know, I'm sure he probably saw some video before the game, but he was told, look, guy's got a killer changeup, right? So you got to be aware of that, make him bring the ball up and all that. He ends up coaxing a really tough walk in the middle of that ninth inning rally. And that's, those are the things I look for. The physical things, the improvement he's made uh, defensively should continue. Mm. Twins are impressed with what he's done to make himself a better all-around player. And he said when he showed up in Toronto that he wants to be known as a good all-around ball player, not just a, a hitter with a discerning eye. So we'll have to wait and see how long that the Polanco is out. But I think the depth of the 40-man roster that we have talked about on this show mm. a number of times uh, will really come in handy. And it might be the team that comes out of this division will be the team that has the best 40-man uh, roster, the most talented 40-man roster, because everybody seems to be getting injured these days. Email question for you from last night's game. Were you surprised that Max Kepler pinch hit for Royce Lewis in the eighth inning last night? A, a little bit, yeah, because, uh, A, the Twins' future is with Royce Lewis, Lewis. somewhere in the lineup, and I don't know that, uh, that uh, you know, Max Kepler – is uh, Justin uh, Justin Morneau wants to say hi. Say hi to all Twins fans in Fargo. Hello, Fargo. Hi, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was a little surprised and a little disappointed because Max has really struggled at the plate. Right. But, uh, you know, you, you look at the moves that they made and when they made them, and they, they used every bench move they could <laughs> except for the one guy on the bench who could run, Castro, saving him in the event they needed him in the ninth they needed him in the ninth he stole second base and that really opened up uh, the whole inning again so um yeah i was a little surprised but i don't think that you can make an argument for how they handled the bench and the bullpen i mean de leon and and uh, winder pitched the last two innings yeah. and uh, if he doesn't pitch scoreless innings maybe uh, we have a different outcome i'm maybe i'm putting you in a tough spot here to ask but just to me Still trotting Kepler out there is, is odd to me. I don't, I don't know. It seems like they have other options. I don't know why the reluctance. Same with Pagan, I guess. I'm, I'm on both of those that I'm, I'm struggling on. I, I'm sure Twins fans are as well, and you hear from them at the ballpark or certainly online. Like, what, What's the decision-making with each of these guys to hold on to them right now And clearly they are both scuffling? Well, Max is a really, really good defensive right fielder. Yeah. That hasn't changed. And so as much as uh, we uh, bemoan the fact that he hasn't hit much this year, um, you know, he's still a nice security blanket to have out there in right field. He's made some yeah. plays I'm not sure many other right fielders in this league could make. But what's really intriguing, and I just checked before we went on the air, Matt Walner's hitting over 300 with St. Paul yeah. and really showed the potential to be – and I hate to use this comp, but really a Joey Gallo type player who's going to strike out, but he's going to draw some walks. He's going to hit some, you know, tape measure home runs. So I don't know how this is going to play out. Uh, I, you know, trade deadlines at the end of July, right? And I, I would think that by then teams across baseball, and there's so many of them that are right around 500, uh, we've got to wait for some of the dust to settle, but I'll, I'll be curious when the twins make decisions as to what they need, who they don't need, right. and maybe cut ties with Kepler. I don't know. And he may is in the lineup to, today. So maybe he'll, you know, hit a home run and a double and fans will feel better about him, but you're <laughs> right. He's hitting in the high one hundreds and it's not going up. No, let's take a break. We come back. We'll ask Dick about uh, the scheduling of this. I have the Brewers playing in the middle of the week, which seems silly to me and some other hot topics, including what happened in Oakland last night, which was remarkable. We'll do that. Much more with Dick Bray when we come back on Hot Mike right after this.
Welcome back, everybody. Hot Mike rolls on Wednesday morning. Dick Bramer back with us at Target Field. Twins and Brewers coming up just after noon on Bally Sports North. Bailey Ober, Bailey Ober will start today for uh, the Twins as they wrap up uh, this two-gamer with the Brewers. I, I know you don't make the schedule. I know you don't have anything to do with it, but it that's another confounding thing. At 34,000 last night on a Tuesday, I can only imagine if they play this Friday, Saturday, Sunday, what this could be like both here and in Milwaukee when they play later this season. It's easy to imagine that because yeah. it used to be that yeah. way, you know, and, and I don't understand it. I, I the complexity of making a schedule. Uh, I don't even know who do uh, yeah. who does it now, whether it's spit out by a computer or what happens, but you know, they said when they revised the schedule about 15 years ago that, you know, no, we can't do that. They have to play during the week. What I don't understand is why we have seven games against some opponents within the American league and six against others. And it would seem to me that, no, we really don't need to play the Yankees or the Red Sox seven times. Let's take a game away from them and find a way to make sure it's a weekend series, both here and in Milwaukee, because it's fun. It was a fun atmosphere last night. I don't know. 10, 15% of the fans here were brewer fans. Maybe, I don't know, but you, you know, it's, it's a friendly rivalry. It's not, you know, Red Sox and Yankees were, you know, you, you know, run the risk of being hurt or you know, worse if you're sitting next to a Red Sox fan and you're a Yankee fan, right? <laughs> it's a friendly rivalry. Yeah. It's fun. The players, Justin talked about it last night, how much fun it was to be in Milwaukee and hear the Twins fans there. I hope that they can find a way to make it a weekend series so that people from Rhinelander who want to watch the Brewers yeah. in a different ballpark can drive over here for the weekend. And similarly, somebody from St. Louis Park wants to go see uh, the ballpark in Milwaukee, they can do the same. Well, especially now when everybody's playing everybody, it's not like the even like what we've had forever. Like, let's make this work. Just this is this is an easy fix to me. I, I don't I don't <laughs> on the list of priorities, this is an easy one to me. Well, and it seems like a no brainer, yeah. right? I mean, the, the owners uh, are uh, are dollars and cents people. That's right. why they own teams, right? And you're going to do a whole lot better with this matchup, both in Milwaukee and here, if yeah. you have it on a weekend. So I, I don't quite understand why this isn't a no-brainer and let's so uh, let's build the schedule with milwaukee here on a weekend twins are in milwaukee in another weekend and then you know backfill the rest of the schedule speaking of owners uh what happened last night in oakland was remarkable the a's had nearly twenty-eight thousand at the coliseum for reverse boycott uh i watched a little bit of it dick it was fascinating to see this play out i know we've spoken about uh the conditions out there and the situation with the a's uh i thought just Whatever, if they took a stand, and it, it looks like this is already down, the tracks are laid down, this is going to happen, which is terrible because I think Oakland's a great baseball town. Um, it was still something, it was a sight to see last night. I'll just say that. Yeah, and then the A's, uh, won again. coincidentally, <laughs> won again yeah. for what, their eighth win in a row yeah. or whatever it is. And now, now Kansas City has the worst record yeah. in the major leagues. It's not Oakland anymore. Uh, it's really a shame. You know, the ballpark needs to be done away with. But I, you know, hey, we almost lost the Twins. We lost the North Stars. Uh, it comes down to ownership and leadership within baseball. Now, the 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 deal, the stadium deal in Las Vegas gained some traction yesterday. Right. It passed through the Senate. It may pass through uh, the other chamber of legislature uh, in, in Nevada, and then the governor is expected to sign it. And then it will all be laid out on the table for Major League Baseball. And they are meeting this week, the owners are, but uh, apparently not to discuss the Oakland Las Vegas situation. That vote would come later once it passes yeah. the Nevada uh, political structure there. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I would think if the sentiment within baseball is no, we don't want to give up that market. I think that's unlikely because yeah. they were willing to give up this market Correct. 20 years ago yeah. in contraction. So it seems like it's, it's, you know, inevitable that the A's are going to, going to move to Las Vegas. And maybe then that will open up an opportunity for baseball to expand against in, again in Oakland if they can ever get a stadium deal worked out there. Well, if they're going to expand, they got to go back to Montreal, in my mind, and put another one in mm-hmm. Oakland. Okay? I, that, that's me if I were to do that. But in light of what you said of seeing the scene last night in Las Vegas with the Golden Knights winning, that can only embolden Major League Baseball to say, well, look at – Look what's happened here. We can have this with our sport. 
Yeah, but then you wonder, you know, the population base of Las Vegas. Now, obviously, there's a big tourist industry yep. there in Las Vegas, but they've got two professional sports teams already. And, you know, what, you know, it, it would have to be a dome stadium in, in Las <laughs> Vegas because I've been to Las Vegas in the summertime and it's 112. <laughs> so it would have to be an air conditioned dome stadium. Uh, I don't know it, it, if anything is better than the situation the A's are in now, but I do feel for the fans because uh, they've been very loyal. And when they've had good teams and they've had good teams recently, they drew okay. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's in a, in a sense, and I hate to make this comp, but it's almost like the situation was here. You know, it was the ballpark, all the threats of relocation and yeah. contraction that we went through. It was the Metrodome. It wasn't the fan base. No. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I kind of, kind of feel a kinship uh, with the fans in Oakland yeah. and uh, it's, I don't know that it's a done deal yet, but it sure is headed in that direction. Uh, before we go here, some attention to the Cincinnati Reds of what they're doing. This might be Major League Baseball's next young team. With I mean, I don't watch a whole lot of Reds baseball. I might now for what they have going on. It's crazy. Yeah, and I kind of liken where the Reds are now to where the Orioles were last year, and look where the Orioles are this year. You know, yep. I mean, we haven't, you know, the Twins are, what, a game above 500. And we say, well, yeah, well, we're done with the Yankees. We're done with the Astros. We haven't played the Rangers or the Orioles yet. And they're they're two they're really of baseball's good. best. Yeah. So that's ahead for the Twins. Uh, I'm excited for that because I like it when, when markets that have been down and the Reds were just horrible yes. last year. Uh, 100 losses. Kyle Farmer, who's now with the Twins, led them with 78 runs batted in last year. So it's exciting when you see markets that have been, you know, really struggling yeah. over the last few years as Baltimore was and as Cincinnati has been when they start to turn things around and then you realize the Twins are in a division, the American League Central, where, you know, Detroit thought they were on the cusp of maybe turning things around and now they're back 10 games below 500 and Kansas City, as I said, they've got the worst record in baseball now. I know you got to go do some mic checks and get ready to get on the air. Thanks so much for the time. Have a great call. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Hey, it's like 40 minutes for me in makeup these days. I'm, you know, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm back up against the clock, yeah, you but better I always go. enjoy the, always enjoy the chat. Dom. Thanks, Dick. Dick Braver joining right. us from target field twins coming up against the brewers uh, at noon on Bally sports North important to note, by the way, for people have been asking me on the Bally stuff, uh, July one is what we're hearing. July 1 is when Diamond needs to pay the Twins. And if they don't, uh, then baseball is going to, uh, to intervene then. And we can have a decision uh, in the not-too-distant future. But at least for the next couple weeks, you can watch the Twins on Valley Sports North. I th July, they're not going to make anything happen before July 1. At least from how I understand it, that's what it's going to be. We'll take a break. We come back. We'll check in on one of the great stories going on in Minnesota high school baseball. The Faustin Greyhounds representing Northwest Minnesota are still playing. Have a chance to play for a Class A state championship later today. We'll check in with their head coach from St. Cloud when Hot Mike returns.
Welcome back, everybody, to Hot Mike here on this Wednesday morning, hazy, smoky hump day here. Not going to deter, at least for now, some of the sporting events happening around the area. That includes the Class A baseball tournament where we're down to the couple final couple days of high school sports uh, for the 2022-23 calendar year. Uh, we still have a couple teams playing. Perham will play in the A tournament in about a half hour as they'll take on Fairmont with the winner moving on to the championship game. And in Class A, the top seed was beaten yesterday as uh, Southridge got knocked off by Belgrade, Bruton, El Rosa, and they, the Jaguars, will get the Faustin Greyhounds, who are still alive after they knocked off Legacy Christian Academy in a run rule game. Uh, we're pleased to welcome back to our show. Every time they make state, we visit with Ryan Hanlon, Faustin baseball coach, who joins us from St. Cloud. At uh, you talk, Are you at the batting cage? Is that where you're at right now? Well, we're on the bus right now, heading to the batting cage, yes. <laughs> well, congratulations on the win yesterday. Uh, and back in the state semifinals, describe this this team. I want to get to how you guys got here in a minute, but uh, the performance yesterday and now knowing you're a win away from, from playing for the whole thing. Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me on, Dom. I appreciate it. I always enjoy being on. Uh, yeah, yesterday was just an outstanding day. Um, we've got a, a big group of seniors. We've got eight seniors this year. And, um, you know, they, some of them were on the team in 2021 when we were down here and, and, um, they had set a goal of trying to win this first game. You know, we haven't, we've been down in the state tournament four times, but we have never won the first round game. Mm. And so that was kind of the goal that they had put, put forth and, and boy, did they, uh, come out and they were on a mission yesterday. It was, it was really fun to watch, uh, just kind of weathered the early storm of baseball, you know, and, and lots of emotion and all that, and then uh, settle in and play. And then it, once the bats came to life, it was just, from a coaching standpoint, just step back and watch. It was fun to watch. Uh, they were, like I said, they were on a mission. Did you get a sense before the game seeing it in their eyes, or was it It didn't materialize till the fourth inning last night? Well, you know, we knew that they were focused and they were ready. Like I said, when you have – eight seniors and you're playing nine kids, <laughs> you know, they've got a lot of experience that have been there. And, and, uh, but you know, one thing about baseball is you just, it's hard to compare scores and, and teams and scouting reports because everyone, every game is against a different pitcher right. and every team has different pitchers, you know, so you kind of look and oh this score, but then this score. And, and so we didn't really know much about legacy Christian, except for they had one very, very good pitcher who was going to Sioux Falls pitch mm. and, and and we saw him, and he kind of um, took it to us the first couple innings, and we just said, you know, keep keep working and keep having good at bats, and we're gonna we're gonna figure it out here. And and then once one guy did, and then then the next guy did, and then it was uh, look out. And it was just a lot of fun. What was the reaction like, Ryan, after the last out last night, knowing you were moving on into the winners bracket? Well, it was you know emotionally it was pretty awesome, pretty mm-hmm. special, um, but it was a it was a 10 run game at the time. So it wasn't as intense as maybe some of the games, but <laughs> after, after when you step back and you think about what you actually accomplished, it's, it's pretty special. And uh, then the kids knew that this is the only team in Foster going to be in the top four now. And um, which is exciting. Um, and, and then you take a step back even further. Like you just said, as you're one win away from going to a state championship too. So, uh, it's, it's immediately let's refocus and let's get back to work. It's BBE today. I know you don't. I know you probably don't know much. Of, how, how much homework can you do after you win if you get ready for who you're playing today? Yeah, you know, not much. Yeah. You, we we've always just stressed, worry about yourself, and so we just need to go and and play good, clean baseball, and that starts on the mound for us. We got to be able to uh, mix our pitches and throw a lot of strikes and make plays and. And then we always say at the end of the game, if, if you've played your best and, and you don't have the lead, well, you tip your cap to your opponent. But uh, let's not beat ourselves. And uh, so we worry more about ourselves. Everyone you play down here is going to be tough, you yeah. know. So you can scout all you want, but um, everyone's going to be good. It's the state tournament, and BVE is probably uh, the team that's just the most red hot right now. They yeah. went through their section and through the loser's bracket too yeah. and uh, um, beat some very good Team Section Six has been well represented at the state tournament for many years, and and then to come in and beat Southridge in the first round is, was pretty special for them too. So uh, we know they're good. We know everybody's good down here, and so 
uh, like I said, we're just going to focus more on, on ourselves and see what happens. What's the fan turnout, Ben? You had some people, or you, you expect even more down there today? Yeah, you know, we, we got the 6 o'clock game last night, which was pretty awesome yeah. um, because a lot of people were able to drive down the day of, and some of them stayed overnight. Actually, a lot of them stayed overnight, and I'll be back today, and some are driving uh, back again today. But the support has been awesome. We had a great crowd yesterday. Nice. And, Lots of support back home, too. You know the small-town yep. feel. Everyone's excited about it. They're either listening on the radio or they're streaming it. And <laughs> um, our our movie theater actually uh, streamed the game for free. For that's awesome. To come in and watch uh, on the theater. <laughs> and so I heard it was just packed there. <laughs> and so that's fun. And uh, that's the small-town feel that, that we enjoy so much. That's awesome. That's that's such a cool uh, deal. I have in the back of your mind, have you let yourself get there? Like, boy, we get this. We get to play at CHS Field. We get to play at in, in St. Paul. And in, in the very back of your mind, have you let yourself go there yet? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you, you think about that. And as much as it's, you know, our our motto all year has been one pitch at a time. But you, you know that it's right there yeah. for the kids. And uh, like I said, this group has just done so much for our program. And they've played so much. You know, a lot of them have been four-year starters. And, um, now to the state tournament twice, and so um, you, you want them to experience that too. And so, yeah, you think about it a little bit, but um, then you also go back. Well, we got to get out and throw that first pitch and get that first inning and kind of go from there. I got to go back to last week, Ryan, with how the section tournament played out because you guys did it the hard way. After that loss to Sacred Heart, what was what was the the, the meeting with the guys, knowing okay, we're going to have to go the long way if we want to make, make reach our goal. Yeah, um, you know, it was it was one of those things. Obviously, it was a big emotional game, and Sacred Heart scored in the last inning to yeah. beat us. And, um, you know, it's been a rivalry for us the last uh, – Boston Sacred Heart have yeah. been in the section championship six of the last seven years now. And, <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's a rivalry, and we knew that. But um, it also was a chance for us to just go, hey, now there's no pressure. Let's just go out and play. Let's just go one pitch at a time. And – good bad otherwise let's focus on the next pitch and and when you have like i said when you have seniors and uh they understand those things and they just kind of played loose after that uh put together a really good uh elimination game to get back to the championship and um got a little confidence early in the first championship game and just kind of rode that through and came out on fire in that second game and scored four runs in the t- in the bottom of the first and just really never looked back so i think it was kind of it was disappointing, but it also was, hey, there's no pressure now. Let's just go play and let's have some fun and uh, just take it one pitch at a time. I know I've asked you this before and uh, how basketball went in, in the wintertime when it was you guys and Sacred Heart to go to state. Is there some leftover emotion from that, from March, how things went down there? Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure, yeah. And, you know, Sacred Heart beat us last year uh, in baseball, too, yeah. and um you know, and we beat them the year before, but yeah, <laughs> basketball obviously was a part of that. A lot of our kids are on that basketball team, and so they remember that. And um, yeah, it, it was uh, sweet that way for sure. And uh, there's a lot of respect between the the two programs for sure, though. Um, we know that they make us better, and we hope that we make them better too. And uh, so it just seems like um, it's extra special when that happened in basketball, but yeah. it's just awesome that these boys are able to do it and come through the, the loser bracket. Like you said, tell me, you feel like you're carrying the flag for Northwest Minnesota. You got, Hey, we can play baseball up here and we're, we're going to show it. And we have shown it. That's exactly what our message was to our guys after the section tournament. Mm. You know, we, we talk about that all the time that, you know, you don't always get seated down here, but we can play up in Northwest Minnesota and, um, you know, Rosa showed that, and yep. um, New York New York Mills has been so competitive. Yep. Hart's been competitive. You know, we won the Constellation Championship in 17, and Red Lake County has been down and competed. And so we're like, just because you win the section in northwest Minnesota doesn't mean you can't compete with the rest of the state. And that was our message to our guys. Let's go down and, mm. and show them that we can play some baseball. I got to ask here, no, knowing you're still playing, I – when did you actually get outside? I'm curious about that. When was your first uh, practice this this spring? When did you finally get outdoors? Well, that's a good question. I don't <laughs> know off the top of my head. It was it was earlier than last year. Last <laughs> We're all, year, okay. we get to Florida for a week. You know, last year we went down to Florida for a week, and and then we didn't get out. We came home and we didn't get outside until May. This year we were out a little earlier <laughs> okay. than that. But 
I do know this. We only had three practices outside this year on the field. So um, wow. it wasn't like we were outside super early. It was uh, it was later, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. And, and uh, our kids embrace that. You, sometimes you've yeah. got to be in the gym for a long time and you can't complain about it. You just have to keep working, and it's not ideal by any means, but uh, that, that is what it is. So um, it seems like it's every other year you're inside for quite a long time, and <laughs> Um, this is one of those yeah. years. So it make you appreciate this season even more, Ryan. The fact that you guys had three practices, and here you are, you're a game away from playing for the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just a special group of kids. Uh, they they work so hard. They put in so much time, um, and they they stuck it out together. You know, they played Cal Ripken baseball and summer rec baseball, and Babe Ruth and Junior Legion and Legion and. And uh, they stay together, and and usually that doesn't happen. Usually you don't have classes of this big, not in in a town our size. Yeah. And these guys did, and um, and it's, so it's it's special that way too. And and it's when you just step back and look at what they've been able to accomplish and how they've been able to do it. Like you said, they only have a few practices, and and then at the end of the year it seemed like we were playing every single day. I bet. And we were just, it's just a grind, and you know our our thing was we just hoping to stay healthy and hoping to get through that grind of five six games a week and if we can do that and get a little rest before the playoffs i think we we got a shot and that's it everything fell our way and uh you, you definitely need some luck too and and we had some luck on our side this year so that was good hey before i let you go you, can you take a couple hacks in the in the cage when you get there the guys let you do that or no I don't think anybody wants to see that. <laughs> Come on now. Uh, maybe maybe some of our assistants would do that, but uh, no, not not me. That's long gone for sure. I don't know if it was ever there actually. Come so. on now, I would, we could see that. So, hey, I appreciate the time. Good luck this afternoon, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys play on Friday morning. Okay. Sounds great. Thanks for the coverage, Dom. Appreciate you it. You got it, Ryan Hanlon, Boston baseball coach, joining us on the way. To the Diamond in St. Cloud as Faustin will take on Felgrave Brutnell Rosa. That's coming up at 1.30 this afternoon. We'll have highlights on WDAY News uh, today as the winner of that will play at CHS Field in St. Paul Friday morning for the Class A Championship. That's at 10 o'clock. Other side of the bracket is New Ulm Cathedral in Lyle. They'll play at 11 a.m. at Joe Favor Field in St. Cloud. They have a nice setup down there where they're able to play uh, two separate classes, both A and Double A, are playing in St. Cloud. Triple A is playing in Chaska, and then Four A is playing all their games in uh, in St. Paul. Uh, it's a neat deal. I like uh, that the fact that they've gone there. They they played at Target Field for a while, um, which is cool. I'm sure the guys got a huge kick out of that. Perham did that a few years back, making it all the way to Target Field. But I think CHS is a. It's not as cavernous, obviously. And it'll be a cool environment. And if either Perham or Boston win today, they're playing for a state championship come Friday. We'll take our final break. We'll come back. We'll wrap up the show and get you ready for a busy sports Wednesday. Hot Mike wraps after this on WDAY Extra, KSFL, and Inforum.com.
Okay, wrapping up the show here on this Wednesday. One note, uh, I'm actually heading out on vacation after today's show. Uh, Logan Campbell will be filling in for me for uh, the next week plus, so you'll be in uh, great hands there. Uh, looking forward to some little time off to recharge, hang with the fam a bit. Big weekend, Jackman's birthday on Saturday. It's going to be four, which is crazy. Um, so excited to celebrate uh, uh, him, and uh, we're going to do that this week. So uh, I mentioned Logan will be in uh, the big chair starting tomorrow, and I'll be back uh, later next week right on time for the uh, Red River Amateur, which we'll be bringing you three days of golf beginning next Friday. We'll be live out at Moorhead Country Club. Uh, the show will be, and uh, we'll be out there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for the golf. So looking forward to that. So uh, I'll be gone, but uh, the show rolls on. No doubt about that. A um, couple things I'm seeing here, and just on top of that, we'll be all over um, any recruiting news. This is a large weekend on on that. I'd, I'd say for both North Dakota State and North Dakota, South Dakota State, you're going to start to see uh, verbal commitments start coming in for the class of 2024. So something to keep an eye on here over the next few days. And, of course, we'll have it uh, covered here uh, on hot mic. I would imagine as well, as we sit here on Wednesday morning, nothing official has come yet from the Nelson camp that I would imagine is coming forthright. Uh, maybe Tom Izzy will break that story as well. Um, but uh, again, everything is pointing towards Alabama. It's not done yet. If that makes sense. Again, for people that are still in the dark on this or don't understand from what I'm told, it's not a done deal, but it's trending in that direction. So that's the latest there. Uh, but I will be all over that once there is an official announcement uh, on that. As we do it each and every day, we do what to watch. So let's do it before we say goodbye here today. And let's lead it off. We mentioned twins are coming up here in about an hour's time as they'll wrap up this quick two-game set with the Brewers. Noon on Bally Sports North. Bailey Ober starts today for the twins as they go for uh, this quick two-game sweep and try to make it uh, four or five wins after being swept by uh, the Rays and get that magical two games over 500. Is that possible? We'll see if they can do that. That's coming up at noon. Yes, for you nerds out there, I put this on there because now we're getting to the time of the year where the live sports gets uh, far and few between. But we have tonight the SEC schedule reveal. Six o'clock on the SEC network. For you football nerds out there, this is a big deal, actually. For the 2024 SEC football schedule, the opponents will be revealed. Not the dates, but the opponents. Why that's big? Obviously, that's the first year that Texas and Oklahoma are coming into the league. There's already been some leaks. Georgia is expected to play both at Alabama and Texas in 2024. That is, <laughs> that's tough. At Alabama and at Texas in 2024. Also, every SEC football team will play Oklahoma or Texas in 24. I like that. If they're going to come into the league, make sure everybody plays them, one or the other. So that's coming up tonight. Again, it's not the dates of the games. It's who's who's playing, which I think is intriguing to me. Like for Texas, it looks like that they're going to play uh, road games at Texas A&M. That will be crazy. And Arkansas which is great, in addition to playing, of course, Oklahoma and a home game with Georgia. Sign me up for that. That's what the Big Ten was missing out on by staying at eight conference games. And I get it. It's not great for the S for FCS teams. But when you have nine, you play as many conference games as you can. That's what people want to see. Yankees, Mets, I put on there just because I'm going on vacation. And maybe by the time I come back, the Mets will be officially eliminated from the National League playoff race. They're 2-9 and nine in June. Good Lord. We got to roll. Thanks to our guest today, to Drew Trafton, Adam Brill, Dick Bramer, and Ryan Hanlon. If you missed our show, you can podcast it later today at Inforum.com. Have a great Wednesday, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow on Hot Mike on WDAY Extra.
game? Technically, but the point of the game is to come up with challenging words. No, the point of the game is to win, and I did. Ugh. Okay, rematch. That was your rematch. Best of five. <sighs> you're a sore loser. No, you're a chicken. What? I'd have to see me.